me tell you a bit where this came from. It didn't come out of the blue sky. Uh, morale and even and, and some of your, your other members had met with me a number of times and uh, talked about what was needed. And I suggested that Marty and I get together and dialogue a bit uh, on a seminar, not a, well, it was a symposium that I was asked to participate in about 10 or 15 years ago at the Eastern Analytical Symposium. Uh, and th this, this was uh, a, a symposium uh, that the members of the EAS had, had wanted, and that and it was called Bridging the Gap between graduate school and industry. And they had six or seven of us talk for 20 minutes apiece. Um, and it was a very mixed group of people. There were only two academics. Everybody else was from one way or another from industry or government, including, very importantly, two people who were headhunters. And the headhunters really came at things rather differently than, than the academicians and, and the people in industry. These were managers from industry. And I accepted and had no idea what I was going to talk about. Uh, so I decided to contact a lot of older graduate students who'd been out for more than five years. And there are quite a few of them, and I don't know how many responded, but it was on the order of 20 plus. And I, I said, okay, here's a list of everything I think you did in graduate school. Rank it. Rank each of these things on a one to five scale. And it was all over the place. And I'm not going to bore you with the charts, which I showed. Uh, but there are, there are some other things that happened. I thought I wrote a comprehensive list. It was not. Because my old students and postdocs added liberally to the list. And that was actually the most interesting thing about the survey, what, what, what they added. And Marty and I have swapped a lot of this information. And there's a big, old, he, he did a similar thing with some of his employees. Is that? Yes. So the only <laughs> difference being less than five years. So I tried to get sort of what, what was the biggest aha moment when you were at Ken uh, Gingers' room. Yeah. So that's, that's where this came from. It's coming not, not so much from me, but from my old students and postdocs and from Marty's current co-workers, okay? Um, and I just wanted to pull out a few things uh, to just state them. And, and then, you know, we, Marty and I can talk back and forth. You can ask questions, whatever. But we, we, this is the end of my introduction. Um, <laughs> The one thing I want to make sure I say today is I've been in academics for 46 years now. I have never talked to an interviewer ever about a student and not be asked what are his or her verbal and written communication skills like. I've had many discussions where the technical knowledge of the person never came up. I cannot possibly overemphasize how important learning to communicate about what you're doing, about your dissertation work, is to getting a job in industry. Cannot overemphasize it. And also in writing, because you, you have to communicate in writing to people who are not at your site. So that's where I wanted to start. That was my. If you forget any, everything else I say, don't forget that. So maybe I'll uh, just, by the way, if you look at uh, things there, you'll notice uh, the top several, with the exception of mentoring and research work, do have to do with communication skills. Um, so just a couple of thoughts on my, uh, what I call unscientific survey. So there's roughly, I think, eight uh, associates who I talked to. Um, and I'll get to some conclusions uh, rather than go through all the details. So I think first and foremost what I heard was, um, and what I would impart to you, is ownership of your own development is, is a critical factor. I think too often, particularly for young graduate students, the notion is I'm going to sign up with Professor X and then everything is set uh, as if he or she 
uh, is somehow a puppet master and, and uh, you know, they're called an advisor, not a decider uh, for a reason. Uh, so I know most of you are not first year graduate students. Uh, it's not too late. Um, so uh, I, I do think taking ownership of re and recognizing that, uh, hey, no one knows your strengths and development needs better than you and uh, might be obvious, but Keep in mind, nobody cares about them as much as you uh, either. Secondly, I would say the cliche applies of plan your work and work your plan. Um, and too many people think of that in a time-bounded way. So I have a, a weekly planner or I have uh, a monthly plan. Um, think about your planning, you know, sort of from stem to stern. So a daily plan, a weekly plan, a monthly plan. A plan for your work that's not time bounded. Uh, so your research project, for for example, um, one of the real deficiencies of students coming into our labs is just simple project management skills. If you Google project management or project management institute, you will find a wealth of information uh, on the internet regarding basic project management skills, and it's not sequential. Do every experiment once or twice until you have convinced somebody that you've got enough to get a PhD, which is, I, I think, uh, relatively common. I think in addition to... Marty, can, yep. let me jump in on planning, if, if you're done with planning. Oh, yeah. Um, one of the uh, headhunters really firmly made a, a point that you need a career plan, not not just a research plan, and, and his his formula was time-bound, and he says you need, you need a plan for a month and you need a plan for an entire quarter on how you're advancing your career. Now, certainly you guys are advancing your career by, by getting your research done, but there are other aspects of advancing your career, and I'll just throw one out. Ultimately, you're going to need at least three letters of recommendation. Three is sort of the canonical number. You have to be finding people who will write you good letters, and that takes a while. So that's part of your career planning. You're networking like this organization. You don't know when, way down your career, you're not going to be thankful you know some somebody in this room who happens to have a position at their company. So career planning is a very long-term thing. And you need to start doing that now, but certainly taking care of your research is, is number one. That I'm done. Um. Yeah, and some people find a very a daunting task to sit down and say, what's my, what's my five-year plan? I, I think you'll find if you do the rest of that planning, I've got a daily plan, I've got a weekly plan, a quarterly plan, as Pete mentioned, I have my research planned out, I've put together an annual plan, it starts to be a, a sort of just a continuation of your work as opposed to, oh my God, I don't know what I want to do three years from now or five years from now. Um, Interestingly, uh, there's a lot more people who have mastered planning their work than have mastered working their plan, which is the other half. Um, so particularly at an institutional level, but it applies personally, I can't tell you how many, you know, I've been at uh, my current employer for 38 years, and uh, in that 38 years, I've probably worked on 38 strategic plans, all of which have gone into somebody's desk drawer, and then we gleefully make our decisions in complete disregard to what we said was strategically important. Um, so work your plan. Be aware of what you said you were going to do. Monitor your progress uh, against it. Um, so that plan your work, work your plan. Um, the third sort of basic uh, was use all of your resources. Th this was really interesting to me. Every one of the people that I talked to felt either an active bias towards academic training in their graduate school program or a bias against um, industrial uh, employment uh, at their graduate school. Um, and when you think about that, it's not particularly surprising. Even if it's not intended, the body of instructors are all people whose passion for either research or education has led them to choose an academic career. So even if their intention is to be as broad in their training as possible, they will have a bias towards uh, preparing students for an academic career in one way, shape, or form, there are a lot of resources available to you, irrespective of whether or not your particular advisor uh, is a good conduit to uh, opportunities. But 
for those of you uh, who either in the audience or will watch this video who have not selected an advisor yet, that's one of the questions I would ask, not just what work do you do, and is that of interest to me, um, but sort of how does that work then translate if part of my long-term plan is a job in industry, how does it translate, and some translate better than others, and if you think it maybe translates, how's that reflected in students that have actually gone out of that program uh, and gone into an industrial setting? And I'm sure we would not have to go far around this building to find professors who wouldn't have 20 students who are in industrial settings to do a survey uh, of, just, again, based on what they choose to research and, and who chooses to research uh, with them. In addition, all over this campus, there are industrial academic partnerships. So we just hired somebody who did his work in the medical school, happens to be a microbiologist. Had no idea that there was this thing called I-Prime, which is a large uh, multidisciplinary center that, that uh, my employer supports, among many others. So be aware of what your resources are, and then Peace already hit, hit the sort of fourth, which is this notion of communication. Um, so he's not heard anybody not ask about communication. I've net, not yet hired someone um, for whom communication was an overdeveloped skill. <laughs> so, uh, and by the way, some of these things happen by chance uh, or, or by, by, by content. Uh, group meetings came up as a really, really strong uh, determinant or, or skill building uh, time, which was surprising to me, but until I thought about it, uh, but dialoguing about science in an open way where you could be critical but not judgmental, if you will. Uh, others don't have to be part of, um, uh, of your research. So I, I, I made a point uh, the last time I was over here, you know, keep a journal. Uh, write in English somewhere, somehow, every day. Um, texting doesn't count. Uh, that's not English. Uh, and when you think about it, a lot of students get into year three or four, and then there's this flurry of writing. Uh, and in the three years prior to that, they haven't written anything. Um, it's a skill it, it, that needs to be developed and, and sort of continued to be mastered and honed. Um, so find your muse as a novelist. Do, do whatever you can. I wrote uh, my own notes, wrote write, parentheses, a lot. Uh, close parentheses, because I think students are getting better at telling stories. I think the PowerPoint and those sorts of tools have helped, and clearly your advisors and instructors are doing a better job of, of um, either modeling or teaching those skills. The same is not true for written communication, um, both as it relates to the types of writing that Pete mentioned, but also as it relates to uh, a, a resume. Um, and don't no offense to the instructors here, don't trust your advisor on what a resume should look like for an industrial setting. So when you think about it, there's overlap, but they're not the same. We did X, it had result Y, and it means Z is sort of academic. We did X, the result was Y, and the impact of that result in a real world setting could be this side or the other thing, and oh, by the way, I've written a record of invention uh, with the intention of getting a patent, or there is some other way I can validate that that impact, so, that, so they're uh, different. So again, the four things were, were ownership, plan your work, work your plan, use all of your resources, and, and um, communication were sort of the, the themes that came out of, uh, and this notion of bias against industrial uh, students, but that's, that, that was sort of a curiosity more than a, a follow-up point.